Hi. Uh, a couple of days ago, I had a really interesting conversation with a Facebook hardware engineer from Egypt. And I didn't even, I didn't even know Facebook made hardware. Uh, and and I, it, it was explained to me that when they bought Oculus, the virtual artificial reality company, they essentially moved into hardware. And apparently there's been a corporate document that's been made public where the idea is to improve upon what used to be known as a quote unquote second life experience where you would have one life, I guess, um, in, in a casual term, your meat life, you know, things you can touch and feel, and then you would have your virtual life, something similar to if you remember playing the game growing up, Sim City, Simulation City. So you would have a simulation, a life where you could pick your own avatar, you could pick your own house, the kind of house that you might not have or be able to afford in, in your meat universe. And you would have variety and diversity and the opportunity to create something bigger than just a group of friends and neighbors that are within physical proximity. And at the end of the conversation, and oh, by the way, Facebook has changed its name, or I suppose will change its name to Meta, which ironically in Hebrew means dead. Well, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it in Hebrew, but it's an interesting irony there, that the fact that your meat life, M-E-A-T, is so poor that rather than trying to improve it, the idea is to create this second life somewhere else. And the attraction is immense. I'm not immune from it either. I spend probably 20 minutes a day playing Simulation City, Sim City. I don't do it, you know, I do it when I'm in the bathroom. I don't do it full time as a substitute for something else. But that may just be my way of, you know, justifying that wasted time to myself. So the attraction is immense. There's no question that there's profit to be made. There's no question that there's profit to be made on the backs of children, teenagers, and adults who are suffering a lack of something in their physical universe. And if you think about how society is set up, it's been set up not to resolve the root causes of the problems in the physical universe. And this appears to be yet another distraction that's taking us away from resolving root causes. And at the end of the conversation between this very interesting engineer who works in Mellow Park, he said that was a meaty conversation. And I thought to myself, you know, I've never really been a fan of small talk. And the reason be is because not only am I not very good at it, but it would take about 10 lifetimes to put all the information that's been amassed in human history together and then provide context. 10 lifetimes, and you would probably have to work full time in all of those lifetimes to get there. Now, why would you do that? You would do that because you owe an obligation to the next generation to put the information in context so that we don't keep rehashing problems that should have been fixed before. And these, these go beyond simple problems involving culture. They involve all kinds of issues. Would they be meta issues? I don't know but they would be fundamental issues. And so never really had patience for it simply because I always thought to myself that I was shirking some sort of moral obligation to myself as a member of humanity if I engaged in talk that was meaningless. Unless I had a sense of humor, obviously entertainment is not a waste of time. I just don't happen to be good at it. So for me and my limitations, the idea is that I shouldn't be wasting my time. But 
when you think about it in context, the metaverse has a, an opportunity to be a total waste of time or an opportunity to create what should take 10 lifetimes into perhaps less time if it's done properly. So obviously the advantage would be education within this metaverse. The idea that you're moving away from being able to see MIT's transcripts and courses and coursework and syllabuses online. And now you can actually enter a universe where an MIT professor or a former MIT professor can, in exchange for tokens, very similar to what's on SimCity right now, where you either engage in some sort of sim simulated work to earn tokens or you buy them. For, you know, in exchange for some tokens, can give entrance to as many people as he wants or she wants to a lecture. And in doing so, create a reduction in time in the quest for reliable knowledge. Now you think about these things and you think about why it's been so difficult. And the answer has been that with respect to cultural differences, we haven't really begun. Let's take an example here. There's no question that intelligence on China has been weak. There's no question that the average Americans or even an elite Americans knowledge of Chinese practices has been deficient for the last 20 years, at least. You ask yourself, why, why is that? And by the way, this is why it takes about 10 lifetimes, simply because you have to probably spend at least half of one lifetime sorting through not just artificial information, but false information, propaganda. And you ask yourself, you know, why is, oh, by the way, there's a delightful and brave movie called Max, which came out in 2002. It stars John Kustak. And the premise seems farcical, but it, it's actually well done. And I, I, if you have a chance to check it out, uh, I, I would give it a chance. So that's Max from 2002. But getting back to the point, when you have to sift through the propaganda, you want to just have to really sort of focus on why it's there in the first place in order to recognize propaganda as opposed to something else. And what I just mentioned about China, the reason that Americans, despite being so advanced in science, math, engineering, and other academic subjects, the reason that the United States is falling behind China is in part because it doesn't understand China, but also because the information that we're getting from China about China is for the most part coming from the Taiwanese or Taiwanese Americans. In order to figure out why that's a problem, you would have to know history. And the history would be, to the extent that you understand it, would not be compatible with the kind of history or understanding that the Taiwanese Americans would want you to believe. From an objective basis, the Taiwanese lost, or Taiwan was made, created as a country when the Chinese within China, a group of Chinese within China, essentially decided to favor foreign investment and some foreign interests over the needs of a majority of the population. This isn't only, this didn't only happen in China, it happened quite, in quite a few places, always with disastrous consequences. You can think about the Khmer Rouge, and none of these are comparable, um, except that from a high level, but obviously the Khmer Rouge would be another example of that. You look at the French Revolution, even the, the Protestant Reformation, everywhere you go, this is a consistent pattern in history. And it often begins with harnessing technology or a group of people that are able to do it. And so when you think about the fact that the Taiwanese were essentially a people invented when they fled China at the risk of death or facing death, they fled China and they came to the United States. What was happening 
was that they were essentially kicked out of China. And so the information that we're getting about China is coming from a group of people that lost the Chinese Revolution and were protected by Eisenhower's Navy. That's what someone from Taiwan is, somebody that lost the Chinese Revolution and ended up creating a cross-border, cross-cultural alliance with the West against the East. That is what an objective analysis would tell you. It would leave out, however, the gains that have come to these small islands like Taiwan and Singapore that have aligned themselves with the victors of World War II. In other words, have aligned themselves with the West in a manner of speaking against the East post-World War II. When you look at it that way, Taiwan is an economic miracle. So is Singapore. The difference, of course, is that Singapore has managed to balance out its relationship with China and the United States, whereas Taiwan has not. And Singapore is, is a much more vital port. It may not be necessarily as much of a vital airspace. Um, it may very well be equal to Taiwan, but there's no question that Singapore and the leadership of Singapore, who happen to be Chinese and who happen to receive support from the Chinese in China, during both Japanese and British occupation, there's no question that they would have a historical basis for at least having an avenue of access into an objective reality that favors Chinese influence. And that history has been favorable to Singapore, which has managed to create a balance. But in America, I don't think most Americans would even be able to find Singapore on a map. I would be willing to say 75% of Americans, more than a majority, a simple majority, would not be able to do so. That's despite the fact that the United States has invested more in Singapore directly, I believe, than all of China. Which makes sense. The port the port's importance goes all the way back to 1511 when the Portuguese took the Straits of Malacca and put it under Western influence, thereby depriving the East and the Middle East of a vital port and a way to promote globalization under their terms and standards and regulations. You put all these things together and what you realize is that the information that we're getting about China, not just China, but every other country, out there has for the most part come from a biased lens that promotes certain relationships post-World War II over others. And as you can see, it's nuanced. Singapore's outcome has been different than Taiwan's because of the support received by people in China. And you think about this from the perspective of an American resident trying to understand why his country is falling behind. A country that for the most part has a per capita income, not even half compared to his fellow residents. How is that possible? It goes back to a lack of understanding and a lack and a lack of a mechanism within GDP numbers and economic data and criteria that allow for the evaluation of subjective knowledge. So what I've just told you, I've claimed that it's objective, and for the most part it is, but it still, it still lacks context. The only way for me to get context would be to go talk to somebody that left China and went to Taiwan during a specific time period. How am I going to get that? I have to go, since I don't speak any Eastern languages, I would have to go back and rely on somebody else's translation. Now, if you know, if you do speak another language, you know right away that something is always lost in translation, no matter how good the translator is. And in order to have a good translation, you have to basically live in the other country 
as well as the country in which you speak the language natively. Uh, everyone who speaks a second language halfway well knows that. So that means that my best case scenario, despite having traveled the world around the world four times and hoping to do it another time at least, is secondhand knowledge, is hearsay, in a sense. And so you can see how the metaverse might be able to fix that, but not if there isn't some sort of mechanism for valuing what I just talked about, which is context, which is the ability to promote some translations over others, the ability to identify them, and then create a way for them to prosper. Now, how do you do that? Because remember, if I happen to have a certain historical understanding, historical understanding of the Chinese Revolution, my understanding is one of the possible interpretations. So how does a company like Facebook decide to promote X versus Y? And we used to have a law in this country called the Fairness Doctrine. Fairness Doctrine. And it said that you, each broadcast station, back in the day when we only had televisions and radio, had to give some time, not equal time, but some time to discussing controversial issues, essentially political issues, and then also provide some time to an opposing viewpoint. And the idea was, back when we only had a physical universe, of course you had television, but it actually had to be in the studio. So you would have to meet with someone who had an opposing viewpoint, and the chances of going out to coffee or lunch would be far higher than, and getting somewhere useful, like I did with a Facebook engineer a few days ago, would be far higher than any sort of virtual experience, no matter how good the graphics become online. So the idea of a law, you have to remember that the a laws, a law represents an ideal destination. It doesn't mean you're going to get there. In order to get there, you have to have a lot more. You have to have a lot of intangibles that are not quantifiable. And you can sense that just like Germany in, 19, in the 1930s, and to some extent in the, in the early 1940s, which was more advanced than any other nation in science and engineering until the United States stole or attracted German engineers, as well as Hungarian engineers, as well as occupied residents of Germany. Until that happened, the United States was not able to shift the tide of the German Reich. So it happened because of a cultural transition. It happened because of a cultural, of the ability to project a kind of culture that was attractive. And I suppose I'm arguing that that, that kind of attraction requires principles that are also unquantifiable, but must include the idea of one generation passing on or shortening the time of understanding the knowledge that's being built up for the next generation. So we have more information than ever before. And the idea would be to get a Rosetta Stone of a sorts so that the next generation can at least sift through the knowledge that's coming at them and being made every day. Can at least sift through it in a way that allows them to improve upon what came before. Now, you think about our understanding of other countries, which of course circles down to our understanding of other cultures and other peoples, which then influences how we behave, whether we decide to go to a beach in Mexico or a kibbutz in Israel or a fort in Oman, or a mosque in Iran. All of that is influenced by economic factors. Your passport, where you're born. So you get the sense that this metaverse could bypass all of that in favor of people in developing countries. So if you have a weak passport, in the metaverse, it doesn't matter. Your Iranian passport or your Philippines Filipino passport 
has the same weight as a Japanese or a Singaporean passport or even a, or a German passport. Now, what's interesting is when you think of it that way, it's very easy to become optimistic, but not if you think about the downsides. The downsides could be that you're simply adding more distractions with less context, thereby increasing the amount of time necessary to provide context or a Rosetta Stone of understanding. You're increasing the time from 10 lifetimes to perhaps 11 or 10 and a half. So the question is, even if you provide, say, equal time, you, don't, you then have to have a way of sorting through that information. So let's say you have somebody in China and you find the perfect translators and you have a way of linking to a lecture about the Chinese Revolution and the founding of Taiwan from both a Chinese expert in Shanghai, as well as a Taiwanese expert in Taipei, as well as somebody in Hong Kong. Put all that together, it's still not gonna be enough because remember, the idea is to shorten the amount of time necessary to gain an understanding, not lengthen it. And if you do what I just said in the metaverse, you'd simply, you're not helping because you haven't provided context in a way that allows somebody else to go searching for the knowledge that they want or that they are interested in. So you're just gonna add on three more videos to the existing volume of information. So what somebody has to do is actually go in, look at all the videos, and then with the experience of both time and culture and travel, has to be able to actually condense the information in a way that does provide a fair guidance to the issues. And you can imagine this happening on a quote unquote Reddit forum style, uh, R-E-D-D-I-T, T. Um, maybe it only has one T, that website. You can, you can imagine it as a sort of live Q&A session where you would advertise a session by somebody who's experienced and then that person would answer questions and you would have essentially a kind of philosophical round table that used to be more common among quote unquote academics. If you're able to do it that way, remember you have to figure out who's going to fund all of this. If Facebook funds it and happens to be, or happens to hire people who are biased to a certain, towards a certain viewpoint, it's not going to work. At every level of understanding and the attempt to impart understanding are going to be pitfalls. And if you put in, it doesn't help if you simply add more people. If you put in more people, then you're running up against more problems. So you actually have to find people who are competent and dedicated. And the question is, how do you do that when we're only in the first inning of globalization with respect to culture? So I've given a few ideas, but in order to really understand this, to try to create a Rosetta Stone that allows other people to understand what's happening and how to get to the point from point A to point B. You also have to understand that our knowledge of China is bound to be negative, which of course relates to the amount of investment, relative, relative investment in that country because of post-World War II alliances. And so right now in this country, we have essentially unchecked military spending. And that military spending, a lot of it is spent not just on recruitment, but on advertising, AKA propaganda. And that advertising is dedicated to a certain viewpoint. It's dedicated to maintaining the status quo, which in this country is essentially a Christian status quo. It's a diverse Christian status quo, but it's still a status quo. We tend to say, all right, we live in a country that values separation of church and state. But what we don't say is that we've got Sundays off. So somebody, this country doesn't have to choose between a Friday prayer and his religion or her religion because Sundays, this holy, the holy day, is a day off. So the people who argue that we have separation of church and state are only looking at it from one particular viewpoint. They're not able to see that in fact we live in a mostly Catholic induced culture. And that goes into so many other aspects, which also makes it difficult to get objective information because you're living in an environment 
that is biased inherently towards one path as opposed to another path. So again, the metaverse ought to be able to fix that, but if it's going to be based on tokens, you can see right away that whoever has the most tokens is going to be able to advertise their seminar over somebody else's quite easily. So there's always been this idea of gatekeepers. And they used to be academics. Quite frankly, they used to be politicians, where academics aligned with politicians who would write the speeches. And the politicians were just figureheads for the most part. People that would negotiate backdoor deals, Lyndon Johnson style. And you go back and then you start to realize that all this propaganda, all this attempt to sift through information is really based on post World War II military alliances that favor one viewpoint or another in one culture, in some cases inter intertwined with one religion over another or others, which make it even more difficult to figure out where we're going and how to get there. But once you understand that, you have an unchecked military spending, which means that it's easier to propagate propaganda in order to sustain one culture over another, one language over another, and to make it difficult for other competitors to come in and perhaps get a slice of that government funding. Once you realize that, you realize that the notion of a political system like democracy has always been, in a sense, a facade. And what I love about Singapore is that they don't make any bones about this. I never understood that expression, by the way. But they don't make any illusions about what their system is. They say that we have to be a small country, we have to be stable and strong. And so as a result, we're going to have a essentially a one-party system but we're going to allow opposition parties and opposition candidates to keep us in check. In other words, the voting system, the democratic style of voting system, will not be capable of replacing a dominant Chinese majority that founded the country and that suffered under occupation along with the Malay minority and the Tamil minority and other minorities, but will also create a situation where the, the votes will show that the PAP where they need to spend their time and what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And by creating that kind of stability, the country will become a destination point for not just goods, but also services and cultural exchanges. And for the most part, it's worked. So the minute you hear people talking about democracy, you have to understand that if really what you know has been trickling down through a filter, it's based more on unchecked military spending it's tied into military alliances post-World War II. That's then, I suppose in a sense, subsumed into the private sector, marketing certain products over another. For example, instead of Persian limes, you might have Mexican limes. Nobody thinks that perhaps there ought to be Armenian limes or Georgian limes and so on and so forth. So you end up with this private sector layer it's attempting to fight through the pre-existing alliances. And then you start to realize that what I know about this country over another is based through a template that favors military spending that is based on a military alliance that is based further on shipping goods from one country to another. Now, in theory, this was supposed to work out very well. Um, a country like Taiwan could focus on becoming and making chips, semiconductor chips, manufacturing them, and then shipping them over under rule, rules and regulations that are agreed upon between the two countries, and that would eventually result in a type of both good and law that could be exported worldwide. Because once you start using the sea for trading, you're automatically trying to export. You're automat automatically in the game of exportation. So in theory, you could have an efficient economic sector, and then from that build cultural understanding as well. And so you could look at for perhaps a country like Singapore might manufacture the best guns. You could see that they, because all knowledge is, is in some sense incremental, you could see how they would use that knowledge to export and then in exchange get, say, water or 
expertise from, say, China or Norway about how to farm salmon or how to preserve water. So they wouldn't be necessarily dependent only on their neighbors and the limitations of their physical geography and physical location. But I think what we're finding now is actually something different. What we're finding is perhaps we've done everything in reverse, that we should have done, every, so that we should have done, done it the other way around. The cultural understanding could have been prioritized over the scientific and engineering and mathematical and shipping expertise, which probably is easier to create in a sense and maintain than cultural knowledge. And, and here's the problem. If you end up with a system that works in one country, whether it's building roads or building trains or water filtration systems, the problem is that once you have a, a debt-based economic system that promotes a leader in all these different categories of economic development, you end up exporting something that may not necessarily be the best fit for another country. So you go to Singapore, which is, again, when we talk about Singapore, we're talking about the most politically successful country in the 21st century, without a doubt. We look at that country and we say, well, this country has a lot of roads. It's got a very good transportation system, but not as good as it could be. Why? And part of it is because it does prioritize roads. That's tied into the American culture of open spaces. Well, Singapore is a small country, and the idea of open spaces and open roads isn't quite fit. And yet, it probably has too many roads. And even though it's made cars very expensive because of taxes, it probably still has too many cars, in a sense, in a relative sense. So you look at all this, and you start to realize that the physical world prioritizes incremental knowledge just like everything else. But the difference is once you have debt attached to it, what ends up happening is even if there are problems, either adapting that physical formula to another location, even if there are problems within the design, original design, you've got patents by the way that protect it, it becomes more and more difficult to go backwards and to replace what is already what has already been created. And we see what's happening now is a patchwork of both regulations and physical products and services that are designed to maintain the status quo and make work, literally make work, but not in a way that necessarily makes us feel as if we're progressing forward. And part of that is just the reason that China is, is doing well is because it didn't have as much oil access to oil as other countries. And so it knew it had to have a quote unquote green economy, an environmentally efficient economy, well before anyone else, well before that term was in, was in vogue. In the United States, at a different physical blessing or curse and went a different way. But then in doing so, it exported that asphalt road, shopping mall, culture in every country that it's been to. And again, that has to do with creating a leadership position, knowing that this design works and we're going to export it. And in doing so, create a relationship between the two countries. And you start to see very quickly that it may not necessarily have been the most ideal situation. And you see that when you go into a country like the Philippines, or sorry, like Manila, which is disorganized as of today, because it has adopted a haphazard economic growth plan compared to a country that maybe had a slower growth plan or maybe had an easier time attracting capital. You go back and look at all this and you start to see how complicated it gets, even if nothing is lost in translation. Because when the Americans say, taking the Philippines as an example, when they go into a country like the Philippines, remember, they're already dealing with, in a sense, they're already dealing with a Spanish influence. And so they have to adapt the Spanish influence, which is probably more extensive in some places than others. And, you know, you send in your missionaries, your religious leaders, and your politicians and your diplomats, and they're supposed to give information back to you, but it hasn't really seemed to work. So you get the sense that the 21st century 
the failures are going to carry over into the 22nd century simply because we're still living in a world where these military alliances dictate choices. Um, because they're really based on not only debt, but this perception that progress involves aligning yourself with a dominant economic power in order to have both security and access to services and goods, some of which are essential and some of which are not. So the entire basis for our understanding of culture in the 21st century has been underpinned by the military and its propaganda. And of course, the military always needs an enemy to the, ex to the extent that it has an imbalanced role in a government's budget. And this, we know this is true, this imbalance, because even a country, the best political system in the world, the most successful political system in the world, one of the most transparent political, political systems in the world in Singapore, right now, the largest line item in the budget is military spending. Now you may say, well, that's not surprising. It's got a port, the port needs security. Of course, you know, when you have that many goods and services going through a single focal point, of course, security spending and military spending will be quite high. But remember that when Singapore was admitted into the United Nations, Raja Ratnam gave a speech in which he said, we seek not to be a warfare. We seek not warfare or a state of warfare. We seek a welfare state. In other words, a state that cares about people's social welfare. And you go back and look at that speech that he gave, it's remarkable. And you get the sense that no one could make that speech today. And that's because everything has been subsumed into this paradigm that isn't working. Or at least only working for some people, or a minority of global residents and rather than a majority. So we talk about globalization and its discontents. And it all trickles down to this idea that, number one, you have an unaccountable historical artifact in a sense, post-World War II, dictating the physical world, as well as the intangible world, like laws and regulations and prices and interest rates, that the physical world, world requires. And because that physical world is failing, both environmentally and culturally, this idea of a metaverse begins to look which, where one's passport is equal to another's passport, regardless of place of birth, the metaverse starts to look like a superior place to be. Steven Spielberg did a film on this, by the way, before, a long time ago, actually. I think it's called Ready Player One. Brilliant movie that foreshadowed a lot of what we're about to see. And you get the sense that our leaders, both corporate and political, have, are failing us simply because if one passport is so deficient compared to another one, wouldn't diplomacy, to the extent that it's been successful or has a chance of being successful, wouldn't diplomacy be able to reduce the gap in something as simple as passport strength? And if not, why not? Because if, if diplomacy, after all, is the first course of defense, not just a war, but it's, it's the first course in establishing cultural understanding, but it's obviously not working having an embassy somewhere else that, that handles passport applications, it's not working. The metaverse is going to be successful. And my fear is that it's going to be so successful that it takes the burden off the backs of, the, of diplomats and of politicians and of corporate leaders and of thinkers and philosophers takes the burden off their backs and it makes them look like they're creating progress when in fact to the extent that a superior world is able to be created artificially it simply reveals the deficiencies in the post-world war ii economic and cultural structures and paradigms that we've created and it's not like this has been happening this paradigm this specific paradigm it's not like it's been around for thousands of years at most it's been around for 500 this, this particular paradigm, the one that I'm in right now, which means that it's reversible in some form, which means that it's possible 
not by me, but by a younger generation that's willing to try to make the effort. And that younger generation would include, of course, the founder of Facebook. We try to figure out how to create a metaverse in a physical universe that don't have the same gaps and inequality as the status quo.